there any relevance of native speaker norms? That's a question for tepalologists. Is it better to focus on form or to focus on forms? That's a question for tepalologists. If you use a textbook, is your classroom authentic? Or should your approach be more learner-centric? From feedback to learner autonomy, we'll discuss it all on Tephalology. Welcome back to the Tephalology podcast, a podcast all about teaching English as a foreign language and related matters. Today, we bring the first of our three interviews conducted at the 2016 JAUT conference that took place in Nagoya in November. As we mentioned in our previous episode, the three of us hosted a forum titled Teacher Interviews, Stories of Transformation. Today, we bring you part one of our forum, featuring an interview between Matt and Sarah Mercer. Sarah works at the University of Graz, Austria, where she is the head of ELT Methodology. Sarah's research interests include self-concept in language learning, complexity, as well as learning agency and teacher-learner mindset, topics which are discussed in today's interview. Hi, thank you for Hi. thank you very much for asking me to do this. I think it's a great original format, and I think it's kind of fun. And if you don't know the podcast, you should take a listen. It's fabulous. It's a great resource for the community, and I'm I'm happy to be part of it. Thank you. We we didn't ask her to plug. <laughs> Thanks anyway. Um, so we like to start our interviews by asking about your journey as a teacher and as a researcher. So could you perhaps uh, give us a the shortened version. The shortened version, okay. <laughs> so um, I started, um, I'm from the UK originally, um, from Manchester, and uh, I originally studied French, German, and politics, and went to university in London, and spent some time in France, spent some time in Germany, and then when I finished my first degree, I decided I wanted to travel a bit more, as perhaps many other people can relate to, and so I did a certificate in TESOL, and I went off to Austria, supposedly just for one year, but that's now 20 years ago. Um, so I kind of got stuck, um, and I started teaching as an assistant in school, and then I got a job teaching language at the university, so I was a language teacher at the university for the majority of the past uh, 20 years. And then maybe, I don't know exactly, but maybe kind of five years ago, I, in fact longer, I started switching over also into teacher education, and then um, a year ago I moved completely into just teacher education. I do miss a little bit the language teaching, um, but I make a very conscious effort to try to go into schools and also attend language classes to try to just keep, keep me grounded um, right. and make sure I don't lose touch completely. And that's why I'm now in the teacher education department. I see. And I want, I want to go back to where your first kind of research interest came from. Now, I've written down here Australia, but it's not at all. It's Austria. <laughs> yes, uh, no kangaroos in Austria. Uh, it's the most common mistake. In fact, most of our post ends up in Australia. So we actually, on envelope, we actually ask people to write Austria, Europe, just to make sure it gets where it's going. So, um, yeah, I started... Um, so, obviously, I, I went with a relatively limited training. I had a, a TESOL certificate in training and teaching, but it wasn't much to go on, and I didn't feel really properly equipped to do it professionally. So I then signed up to do an MA in EFL, right, which right. I did uh, at the University of Reading. Okay. I did all of this uh, long distance, so I did it alongside my teaching career. And um, I thoroughly enjoyed that, um, got a lot out of it, learned a lot, and I, ha I hope it made me a better teacher, more sensitive teacher. And then I kind of felt that I, I still didn't feel like I knew enough, but I think actually I've come to understand that that's a perpetual feeling that no, degree, no amount of qualifications are going to solve that problem. I always feel I don't know enough. Um, but that's what prompted me then to do a PhD. Mm. And if I'm honest, um, when I started the PhD, I was doing it for purely functional reasons to try to make me a better teacher, to try to understand teaching better. I wasn't really motivated uh, as a researcher. Okay. But that changed dramatically. I fell in love with research. I, I fell in love with the research process. I fell in love with research as a form of personal professional development. Um, I, I grow repeatedly through being able to do research. Mm. And I didn't know that when I started right, my PhD. Right, so it came yeah. out of that experience. Yeah. So you, in your talk um, this morning, you talked about your future ideal self. Yeah. So I guess at that time, that um, wasn't fully developed or it's still... Oh, God, I'm going to get myself in trouble here. Um, I, 
I've never really functioned on this sort of ideal self level. It doesn't work for me. I know it works for a lot of people. It doesn't really work very well for me. And that I tend to be a kind of here and now. So if somebody says, would you like to do this? Oh, yeah, great. And off I go. Um, I tend to be very motivated by things I want to do now. So the, 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 the sense that I perpetually want to get better at what I'm doing is just sort of something that's very fundamental to how I approach my own teaching and learning. But I suppose if you're talking about in terms of a drive or a goal, I don't know if I had a particular goal in mind. I just wanted to know more and be able to teach better. Right, I see. Um, one of the things you mentioned on your website that you became first interested in was um, you were noticing that the learner's sense of self-efficacy was playing a crucial <laughs> role in the way that they were perceivably being motivated or their kind of their strategy use. Yeah. Um, yeah, and this led to you focusing your PhD on this topic. Um, could you tell us about this yeah, so concept I, of self-concept? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, um, so I started um, with an experiential approach to strategy training. So basically getting researchers to research their own learning and their own use of strategies. So we talked about strategies in class, but many of you who are familiar with strategy training will know there's this kind of cycle of try new stra talk about strategies, try new strategies, research your experience of that, and then go through this kind of cycle. So I was doing this more experiential approach. And when I did interviews with the students at the end of this, um, I discovered that what they were really talking about, the benefits they perceived of strategy training were feeling more empowered, feeling more confident. And that it was, it was this psychological dimension that was what actually the real, the non-linguistic gains of strategy training were what was really notable to me. And then I just kind of wandered off. I thought I need to understand. I, I started to realize that this, for me at least, was, was fundamental to the teaching learning process, was understanding how people felt about themselves and the process per se. And that's when I kind of wandered off into the area of the self to try and understand how people view themselves as learners. Right. So I started with self-efficacy because this is the construct that's used in relation to strategy training. So they're very often used in correlational models. They're both relatively tightly uh, domain specific, so they're good for statistics. And that was a construct that I started with. It's the first self-construct I became familiar with. And then, because I'm a qualitative researcher, of course, I started to broaden how I looked at things and the kind of things that I was asking. And I, for myself, then understood this to be something wider, and then I moved to self-concept, which has got the cognitive and the affective dimension, and it, it can be a, a bigger construct, fundamentally. But I know that you wanted to ask me about where that went from there, then one of the ways that my understanding has changed is that um, what you have to understand about self is any of the self-constructs that we work with are hypothetical constructs. They don't exist. We just want to try to make self researchable, so we have to create these understandings of self that ideally seem phenomenologically real to the individuals, ideally, but essentially the hypothetical constructs that we create in order to make the vastness of the self more manageable. Um, but, but it's sort of key to understand for me that these are not real constructs. They're not real things. They're just ways of breaking up something that's huge into more manageable parts, fundamentally for, for research purposes, but also for, for communication with learners. And you mentioned that they are more interrelated than you first. So yes, a lot more interrelated. So, so, um, I started with an understanding that I was looking for domain specificity, which I still think is important to understand in the self because we do have um, multiple selves, and understanding the concept of domain, but not domain as we define it as researchers, but domain as the individual perceives it. I think that's important to understand, is that we very often for research purposes, we're the ones, if we're doing research, we define what we think the domain is for that individual. But actually, individuals have their own understanding of a domain that can be in ways that we don't expect. So an example I've very often given is, in my early research on self-concept, I was talking to a learner who said, well, you know what? Um, I'm a really bad writer because I'm really sporty. <laughs> so I didn't automatically see the link, but she taught me through it. And she explained that for her, being sporty meant that she liked stuff that was active. She believed that you had to be a good reader to be a good writer. Ergo, the fact that she is sporty means she's a bad writer. That's how she made the link. But it was important that if you were talking in research terms and you were to, to set the domain yourself, never in a million years would I think of setting it in terms of your sports self-concept. But that was actually a huge part of her language learning self-concept because sport was such a big part of who she was. 
So it has sensitized me to the fact that domains are also quite a subjective thing when we're talking about the self, at least. I see. What factors influence this, the development of one's self-concept? And also, what's observable from like the teacher's point of view? Okay, oh, crumbs. Okay. <laughs> does that make sense? Um, yeah, it does, unfortunately. It's just a sort of quite a oh, question. <laughs> so... Um, there's a lot that goes on internally, so how okay. we process the experiences we have, how we process our past and our present and the people that we encounter. Um, some of the things that um, are, are very important, but what, what makes this very complicated is um, we have self-motivation, so we are driven to either make ourselves feel better or to sort of downward our, our self-estimation. So we have upward and downward drives in our sense of self, so that interferes with the kind of things that we do. But one big thing is social comparison. So we constantly compare ourselves to other people and where we think our, we are in relation to those. And um, one thing that we can do as teachers is reduce the sense of competition and help people to focus on their own personal progress, because that's essentially what we're aiming for. Um, things about discussing beliefs about language learning explicitly, I think, is quite important to do. So um, I talked earlier today, and also in the session yesterday, I talked about mindsets, um, which perhaps I'll come back to shortly. Yeah. But having a fundamental belief that you can improve your ability is absolutely vital to developing a healthy sense of self. Because if you don't believe you can get better, then you're going to show a sense of helplessness, and you're not even going to believe that you can improve. So, you know, I take that as a kind of starting point. Okay, thanks. And yeah, let's let's pick up on mindset. And in your talk this morning, you were talking about teachers' mindset yeah. and how you think it's really essential that we focus on teachers' well-being. Yes. And um, putting that aside just for one second, but we'll come back to that. Um, <laughs> how can mindset affect? What's the role in language learning from the learner's perspective? Okay, um, for me, mindset's a kind of a fundamental foundation. It's something that we need to have in place for everything else to function well. Um, it's not, don't, don't let me mislead here, it's not a magical panacea. It's not like the cure and have this and everything will be okay. But your mindset is fundamentally, do you believe your ability as a language learner is something that can grow and improve? Or do you have a natural fixed talent? So is your ability as a language learner fixed? I can do it or I can't. I'm a language learner, I'm a good language learner, I'm not. Or is this something that can grow and develop? And so J.D. Brown this morning was talking about lots of the things that give us reason to believe that a growth mindset is, is a valid thing to believe in because of neuroplasticity, because the brain grows continuously throughout our lives in different ways, but throughout our lives we can turn to learn and grow. So for me, having a growth mindset is a great starting place. It's not the only thing a learner needs to be successful. They need motivation. They need strategies, they need useful feedback on their practice. There's all kinds of things they need for that mindset to be effective. The mindset alone is not going to be the answer. But if you start with the fundamental belief you can improve, that's essential. And what you asked me before was that I, all my research so far has been looking at mindsets with learners. But recently, my own attention has moved much more to understanding the psychology of the teacher yeah, yeah. and understanding also teacher mindsets. So in terms of professional development and in terms of pre-service training, teachers have to believe that their competencies as a teacher can continually improve. Otherwise, why would they go to professional development events? They might not see the need, they might think they don't need to engage in this. Um, for pre-service teachers, how helpless must it feel if you believe in natural-born teachers and you don't think you have the gift? So, you know, as, as educators, we fundamentally have to believe in the potential for people to improve and get away from this idea that there's a natural fixed talent or ability. It doesn't mean that some people won't find it easier than others. They will. But it does mean that everybody can improve wherever their starting point happens to be. And you mentioned, this is a really hard word to say, but you mentioned that there is reciprocity. Yeah, I struggle with that. Reciprocity, or it might be said differently. Meaning that um, <coughs> the teachers impart their emotions and feelings onto the learners. Yeah. So, yeah, do you think that one, lead, one mindset leads to another mindset? Oh, yes. Teachers are a huge role model. So we have to uh, model our own mindsets as being growth mindsets. So how we talk about learning... Um, one of the most powerful effects that we can have on learners in terms of mindsets is the feedback that we give. And this links again nicely to, to, to what uh, J.D. Brown was talking about this morning. Um, the, the feedback that we give is really important in helping learners to understand that learning is a process 
and we focus more on the process and not the product. So we have to be very careful that we're not saying, oh, you're a great, you did, you're brilliant at this, and suggesting or implying that this is some kind of natural ability. We can talk about, you did a really good job with this, you used some interesting strategies, you worked really hard on this, you approached this in a really interesting way. That kind of thing is important. Um, there's been a sort of demonizing of praise based on this idea from mindsets, and I think it's important to understand that people need encouragement Everybody needs encouragement. We all need a kind of pat on the back from time to time and know that we're doing okay. It's not the same as praise when we're praising the product, which can be detrimental to how learners then start to think about what language learning ability is. So I think focusing on the process of learning and helping learners to, to see this as, a, as a, a, a something developmental is very important. Okay, excellent. Coming, coming back to the, the overall conference theme of transformation, um, you, yeah, you completed your PhD under Dr. Alan Waters, mm -hmm. who uh, sadly passed away earlier this year. Um, I'm wondering if you could tell me what, what do you think his contribution was to our field and to yourself? Um, um, personally, well, he was my mentor, so he had a huge impact on me. Um, Alan, was, Alan loved to be controversial, for any of you who know Alan, and he wasn't afraid to speak his mind, um, which I consider a very healthy trait. <laughs> Um, and Alan was a teacher at heart and he remained passionately a teacher. And what was, uh, what was important for me from Alan uh, and, and something that he taught me is to keep myself grounded in the classroom and to remember the diversity of teaching context. So very often when we write um, or we produce research, we, we start obviously always from your own position and where you are and what's familiar to you, of course you do but you need a sensitivity to the diversity of teaching and learning contexts that are out there. It, makes, it means that we cannot be prescriptive. We have to understand things more in terms of principles that can guide people, but people have to make contextually appropriate decisions in what they do. So Alan has a blog that's still out there, and if you can find it, it's worth looking at. It's called Common Sense in ELT, uh, and that kind of sums him up nicely. Uh, he was very common sense, very pragmatic, and very down-to-earth, um, and he remained very passionate about the importance of teacher knowledge and expertise and respecting that kind of knowledge that teachers have. Their own knowledge of their own experience is incredibly valuable. Uh, and we don't always, as a field, esteem it appropriately. I see. And uh, maybe just one more final question. Um, in terms of your own research, what, what's next? What's coming up? Um, what's, what's changed? What's changed? Okay, since, so the big, shift, conference. the big shift for me has been that mm -hmm. um, all of my research so far really has been about the learner. And probably partly in, uh, for two reasons, if I'm really honest. It, partly because I switched to teacher education, but also because I've been researching um, from a complexity perspective, which will, will not go down that path just now, but okay. from a complexity, from a, a complex dynamic system theoretical perspective, the emphasis is on relationship, and that's also what drew my attention to the relationship between teacher psychology and learner psychology. But then what surprised me was when I started to look at the field for teacher psychology, there's some fantastic, great research on teacher cognition and teacher identities. There's great bodies of research there. But in terms of teacher motivation and other aspects of teacher psychology, there's very little, particularly when compared to learner psychology. And given the fundamental influence that teacher psychology has on learner psychology, I feel this is an area that we need to develop more. So I've been kind of lucky, very privileged at the moment that we're just finishing the first edited collection that's going to come out with Multilingual Matters right. next year. So we're taking next steps. Okay, great. So we'll leave it there, I guess. But Thank you. Yeah, please put your hands together for Professor Sarah Mason. Thank you for listening. We'll provide a link to Sarah Mercer's homepage in the podcast description. As usual, if you'd like to get in contact with us, you can send an email to teflology at gmail.com. You can follow us on Twitter at teflology. Uh, you can like our Facebook page, which is the Teflology Podcast on Facebook. And check out our website, teflology-podcast.com. We'll return with part two of our forum, our interview with Ryuko Kubota, soon. Mm -hmm.